Today's show, the birth of wine. We are going to see something I've never seen before. I've been to vineyards before. I've seen grapes. I've been to cellars before. I've seen casks. I've never been there when they actually pick the grapes, harvest them, crush them, ferment them, and oak them for the first time, or stainless steel, whatever they do. We're going to see that today. Wine being made. The birth of wine, 101. just got off the plane this morning, and this wanted to be my first stop. This is a little church called Lamadon on the highest ground in Fleury. It's really beautiful here. You see everything, panorama. On a good day, you see Mont Blanc in the distance. This church, we think, is from the late 1600s, and it goes back to this tradition of every time they had a great harvest, no disease, good yield, they'd celebrate by building a church, thanking God for you know, nature and the good harvest. And this is this little tiny antique of a church sitting up here on this knoll. From now on, every time I have a little bottle of Fleury, I'm going to think of this church, La Madone. One of the more interesting big new players down in Beaujolais is Louis Jadot. Louis Jadot is known for making wines in Burgundy, which is the region just to the north here. Pinot Noir is the grape, Chardonnay is the grape. Here they're playing with Gamay, and they're doing some beautiful, beautiful work. Most of the pickers are either college students on a little break to do the harvesting, locals or itinerant pickers on their way up to the champagne harvest, which happens next. They work here, it's tough work, but this is one of the few places where the vines are actually hand-picked. This is the first press of the grape. This is minutes old. This is the same vintage two days later. I mean, look at the difference in color. I mean, that's amazing, and it's still working. The alcoholic fermentation hasn't started yet. And once that starts, this will really get pushed. I can't wait. This is really going to be something when it grows up. Amazing. Amazing. <sighs> Glad we came here, huh? This is good. You know, I can't visit this chateau without going down to the cellars for a tasting. So let's head underground with the winemaker, Guillaume. The wine is really born when I bottle it. And after, the life of the wine is at the beginning, during the first day after the bottling, it's like a, a small baby in the hospital. During the several months, it's like a young kid, a smiley, open, on joy. And several months later, the wine always closes up again. In fact, he makes his adolescence phase. Like, like, uh, like a children. Yeah. And like a children, he close up and he work inside for search his adult identity. And I'm sure you have seen that. Uh, a, a, a young wine mm -hmm. completely closed. Mm -hmm. And when it, when it open again, it's adult wine. Mm -hmm. And it begin really his life. Next stop, Momassin, where they're really making wonderful, wonderful wine. Very Burgundian style with the Gamay grape. Here's the young winemaker. This is his first big stint. He's down from Burgundy. You're the second winemaker I've met from Burgundy who's come down to Beaujolais. Why? Uh, because uh, I had an opportunity with Momessin. They asked me to come down to, to try to start a new winery called Monterno, where we are today, mm -hmm. and to, to play a little bit with the Gamay variety. So tell me how you're playing with it. Uh, so we are trying to, to show to people what Gamay can, can produce. What Gamay can make as, uh, as great wines to be able, able to, to age, not only uh, easy wine uh, to drink and uh, only uh, these Beaujolais uh, fresh characters and a uh, lot of people know. And I think uh, our force in Beaujolais is to be the only region in the world plant 100% Gamay, Gamay. Mm. and on volcanic uh, soils. Now let's meet Philippe Bardet. It's his family that runs Momassin, and they've been doing this for five generations. The Gamay grapes has been always forever the, the, the grapes from Beaujolais area, but I think it has been always seen as a light and fruity style of wines, when I think it can, uh, ex it can produce some more serious wines. All these wines can keep, and I, and I don't want to see my wines uh, 
disappear, die uh, after one year in bottle, you know. You can rely on all these wines and you can have a, a good, good surprise after five years, after ten years, and you can keep these wines if you wish. And now on to the biggest winemaker of the region, really the family responsible for putting Beaujolais on the map in such a big way. The family, de Boeuf, needs no introduction. The wines of de Boeuf are famous world around, probably the most popular consumed in the United States. Let's get the family story from Frank de Boeuf, the heir apparent. He's taken over the business. Let's get the scoop. In the 1950s, when your father came here, what was happening with Beaujolais? It was not well known in the States yet, was it? No, it was uh, the beginning of a new uh, uh, era for, for Beaujolais. So at that time, uh, my father, with a few others, uh, came with a, a new idea about uh, the style of the Beaujolais. 2005. I mean, I'm here and everybody's talking about right. this as if it's the best vintage since 61. 61? Why not? <laughs> I don't have uh, any more 61 in my cellar to compare, but uh, again, the, the grapes are superb. Uh, low yield in most of the places, so we should produce a fantastic vintage, definitely. We call it already the, the vintage of happiness. <laughs> kind of hard to go wrong with that. There's a slogan for you. Salut. Salut, santé. Now we're going to visit one of the great rising star small producers, Jean-Luc Bourbon. This was started by his grandfather, Claudius, and now run by the grandson. Interesting wines here. Restaurateurs like Ducasse are paying attention to this guy. He's also playing around with Chardonnay and makes an interesting dessert wine, but let's go out in the field and pick some grapes. Uh, oui, oui, nouvel employé. Michel, Michel. Non, mon bel, non, non, non. Non, pas mon bel. Formidable. I think if I really had to do this job, this is what I'd do. I'd be the guy that carries the stuff. This picking was too hard for me. I'm built for carrying stuff, you know? Short, stocky, southern Mediterranean. It's a little awkward. But I think I can get used to this. I'm not big on ladders. You ready? Yes. From here? Yeah. yeah. Oh. 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 <laughs> Still some in there? Fini? No. Milk. <laughs> well, I guess I didn't get the job. Another day in Beaujolais, just making wine, living the life, eating three-star meals, working a little. Those are cement fermentation vats. That's where the fermentation takes place. Then they're pumped through this plastic tube and they come out of here. And this entire vessel, this entire tube, is then filled with completely fermented grape juice once they decide the fermentation's complete. Here, it's slowly crushed, gently. Then the juice that's coming out of this is, is not really wine yet. It's just the juice of the first fermented grapes and it's known in Beaujolais as paradis. That is what's gonna get transferred into casks for aging. This is the first pressing from that juice, so it's crushed grape juice. Incredibly dark, this is an incredible year. It still has to be filtered, there's lots of stuff floating around it. And I'll tell you, I mean, the nose is really unusual. Red fruit, but almost apples too, I don't know why. It's incredibly sweet, incredibly sweet. Tannins are just there somewhere in the background. Wait a year. Wait a year when it grows up, and then we'll talk about it over dinner. <laughs> With dinner. You know, part of the intimacy, the, this rite of passage for the Beaujolais harvest, is it's, it's hand-picked, it's a lot of labor, but these pickers are actually having dinner, lunch, and breakfast with the families that they're working for. The families are also providing housing for them. So they come in for a couple of weeks, pick, and basically break bread together for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Here we are having family meal, in this case it's lunch, with the pickers being prepared by his wife and mother. 
We're hunting around up here looking for these 120 year old vines. We're climbing these hills and I got to admit, we're all a little bit out of breath. We had a big lunch <laughs> now we're climbing up this hill and we're way up. I mean, below us is the valley. You look down here and it's this big hillside. We're in some of the highest land down here and all of a sudden we see this huge outcropping of what, what was really a former uh, a stone retaining wall. And look at these rocks. These are seashells. So at one point, this soil here was, I guess the word is alluvial, this was under the ocean. We found this, which is, I mean, hey, I live at the beach, baby, that's a seashell. I mean, you know, that's not one of my ugly toenails. That's a seashell. And this, they tell me, was a, actually a squid, and I'm taking that from the locals, that that's the sack of an ancient squid. And they say they find this stuff up here all the time. So it's not unusual to see stones like this that are just laden with seashells. So a long, long time ago, this was underwater. Fish were swimming, clams were doing their business, and Beaujolais was a twinkle in someone's eye. Now we're gonna meet another very, very serious Gamay producer. They're doing wonderful work here at Chateau de Vin. This is Claude Geoffrey. He's the vinter, he's the owner of this ancient vineyard and very old chateau. Let's visit him, taste some wines in his chateau. This is unusual in that they've got their uh, where they're storing the wine now for fermentation is basically underground. And these are just a cluster of... It's kind of funky. This is the beginning of fermentation, and they're pumping the liquid from underneath back up on the top of this to keep the cycle even, so that the top keeps fermenting at the same pace as the bottom. But everything I'm looking at is subterranean. The only time I've seen this done before is with olives in Morocco, same thing. But this is neat. I'll drink. It's delicious. Folks, this was great. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I mean, I really was looking forward to, to doing this. I've never gotten to see wine made like this, like from its conception. Grapes get picked, grapes get crushed, the fermentation, the pressing, and then finally the oaky. This was exciting for me. Hope you learned a lot, because I sure did. Now let's head to my kitchen and cook something. All right, great trip we had. Saw so wine being made, picked wine, almost, <clears throat> I almost fell in the truck. Hey, if I'd taken one more step, that thing would have emptied. They told me that later. They let me make a fool of myself trying to bend over. Yikes. Guess I didn't get the job, huh? Anyway, the, the, the food in that area is really Burgundian food, the food of Lyon is this really bourgeois, heavy food. I mean, there was, for years, people thought that Lyon was the restaurant capital of, of, of France, not Paris, but it's hearty food. You know, it's a sausage, sausage boudin, uh, butter, eggs, Charolais cattle, um, big, heavy, hearty food, and that's kind of what you see around it, those beautiful Burgundian snails, not the petit gris that you see further south that are smaller, but the big, fat Burgundy snails. I mean, that's really, where it all came from, and it's interesting food, it's great food. Maybe the greatest restaurant in France for years was just, just outside of that uh, pyramid where um, Ferdinand Point held court and Madame Point as well. So it's a hell of a heritage. So I thought, what are you going to cook after that? Well, I don't have any boudin, and I don't have breast chicken here. You know, they only have that over there. Um, I don't have any snails crawling around that I can purge and cook. So I thought we were going to make beef bourguignon, which is a stew, typical Burgundian stew. But I thought rather than stews, because, you know, we made doves, we've done a few, they kind of, anyway, we didn't want to do it. So I thought we'll sort of get this beef bourguignon, take it apart, and put it back together again differently. So what beef bourguignon is, is it's, it's rump, it's a, an old rump, which this is a filet, so beef bourguignon was a rump roast that was larded and, and larded with fat to make it better, diced up, marinated in cognac for four or five hours, then seared cooked down with that marinade, some veal stock, garnished with pearl onions, mushrooms, um, and that's the dish. Typically, classically, that's a beautiful, rich sauce, you know, like a, that kind of brassage that you get from all those flavors. Well, again, so we'll, we're going to roast the center. This is a filet mignon. We're going to peel off the side. We're going to peel off this. We're going to take the, just roast the center. It's very simple. Center roast of the filet. And then we're going to take the garnish apart. We're going to just cook these onions white, very simple, with butter and water and cook them down until the pearl onions are fine. We're going to cook these, um, 
Mushrooms with a little bacon. I just love that combination. A little bacon fat. Chunks of lardons. So the mushrooms will find itself with the bacon. And then I'm going to combine a little bit of asparagus tips, because asparagus is in season. It's spring, and I've got beautiful asparagus. And I'm going to do pommes lyonnaise, which is a, a Lyon-style potato dish. Classically, it's, one, it's potatoes like this that are cooked ahead of time, then peeled, chopped, cooked in a pan with, in another pan, a quarter of that same amount of onions. Combine them at the end, a lot of chopped parsley, form them into a little mold, put them on the plate. Just simple. Pommes lyonnaise, I mean, you know, it wasn't very imaginative, was it? So, without any further ado, let's take down this um, piece of meat here. And the first thing I'll do is just separate somewhere in here. And then take off what's called the silver skin. And I'm going to take the center part of the fillet. Say, say this is for four people. So, one, two, three... It's a little thin for beautiful. And we'll just clean this roast. The bottom side where the bones were has a little bit of fat. We'll just trim a little of that off, but a lot of this is going to come off when I'm cooking it, so I'm not too worried about the fat on this side. It'll, it'll melt. All right, I got my potatoes. I got my salted water. Potatoes we have to start, because you've got to cook these ahead of time and then let them cool off, pre preferably overnight. All right, little pearl onions. These are more or less a pain in the neck. Actually, you got to peel them. I'm sure they sell these frozen, canned or something, but, you know, I can't do that, can I? So we're just going to peel these little boys and girls. And All right, we're just going to put in a little more water than that. I want them slightly covered. We're going to put in a little bit of butter here and a little bit of salt. And we're just going to let these... You know, it's old-fashioned cooking. All right, we're going to season up. I didn't tie up this filet with a string, and I know every butcher does, and probably all the chefs do too. And maybe it comes out looking better, but I don't know. This is one muscle. What's it going to do in the oven if I don't tie it? Fall apart? I don't think so. So I didn't bother. I didn't waste the string. But we are going to season the heck out of it because I think that makes a huge difference. So on all sides, salt, fresh cracked pepper, We'll roll it around in here to get up all that excess stuff. Got a nice cast iron Griswold here. Let's see if we can get that oil smoking. Onions are boiling. That's fine the way they are there. Turn them down slightly, but that's what I want. I want them moving. All right, this is going to be the fatty side down first. And just leave it alone. Oh, that's nice. That's nice color. I want all the sides to look like that before they go in the oven. All right, we got it browned on all the sides. Nice color, you can see. And we're just going to go right in the oven like this. Oven's at 350. This pan's screaming hot. So, figure about 15 minutes, and we'll just pull that out and let it compose. I can move this to the front burner. We're just going to keep it on a simmer for now. They're going nice and slow. Perfect. All right, this is just a slab of bacon. I'm going to cut it in just big chunks so it's got some toothsome feel. When you render it down, you know you're eating something here. These are just about done. I can just feel that they're, they're tender. We're just going to let that reduce. When it gets like it's getting thick, we'll just shut the flame off and let them sit warm and they'll glaze themselves. I've got a pan hot here. I'm going to just put a drop or two of oil because obviously bacon will produce its own oil. And this is my lardon. All right, we're going to pull these out. They're nice and crisp. They're rendered a bit. You'll know what you're eating when you eat them. Like big pieces of ham almost. And right in here go my mushrooms. A little salt. All right, and I'm really, I'm sauteing these dry. I don't want a lot of oil in the pan. I want... When I like mushrooms cooked, I like them, I want color, I want them to dehydrate, that concentrates the flavor. We're just cooking the liquid out of these. At the very end, we can hit them with a little butter for flavor, but right now, I just want them cooking and drying out, and that's exactly what's happening. Steam's escaping, flavor's getting concentrated. These are tasty mushrooms. Mix them together. Oh, does that look good already? I mean, the garnish has got you drooling, and that's the idea. This food has a certain seduction to it that's obvious. 
Beautiful asparagus. It's springtime, and these come from, again, a friend's garden. You can see the length of these. Um, this is just, you know, they're beautiful. Picked last night. So we're going to do, you never see them this big in the supermarket. You're just not going to see it. We're going to cut them off down here, because this part, you can just feel woody. So right about here, they go from edible to inedible. And then I'm going to peel them, because I s always felt that you can control the cooking better. And I just keep a little pressure. I peel them right on a cutting board. Asparagus are in. Yeah, done. Knife goes in. Just a tad of resistance. These are finished. Let's check the meat. Oh, yeah. Done. Nice color. That's a nice roast. Beautiful. And we're just going to let that sit off to the side here and compose. For every cup of potato, I want a quarter cup of onion. So I'm going to use a whole onion because that's sort of the magic. And a bunch of chopped parsley at the end. That's the hallmark. And you cook them separately. So we'll have the onions going in one pan and the potatoes in another. And when the onions are ready, we'll mix them in with the potatoes once they're kind of golden brown. Um, just sliced. Potatoes, we'll peel them. I'll peel these over the sink, but you know, the idea is just get the skin off and use the inside of the flesh. So I'll be back in a second. This isn't fancy. This is, you know, this is mom style cooking, grandma style, home style cooking here. So you don't have to get too fussy. All right. Got a nice hot pan for the potatoes. Stand back and just get them in. And again, this is figure for four people or so. And this is just let them in the pan and let them sit. All right, this pan is not screaming hot because the onions are going to burn on the sides if they are, but it's hot enough. Give these a toss, watch out for the oil. And that's what I want to see. This is, you know, exactly what we're looking for is bingo. Now they go together. So oh, it's very simple. And just, I, you could almost, for my taste, you could almost have more onions than this, but you can see it's a good mix. Now we're going to put a good amount of parsley in here. Beautiful. Parsley is really a really important flavor component in here. Let's go right in here. Yeah, it looks good, huh? Come on. Tell me that doesn't look good. Last but not least, I want some sauce for this, because we we're sort of doing this imitation of beef bourguignon, which was a braise. Hello. Need sauce. So I don't have any demi glace. I borrowed this from Mimi Wood at the Washington Inn, who bailed me out the last minute. Thank you, Mimi. <laughs> when you come up short on demi glace, you need a friend. And this is beautiful, gelatinous. Just all we have to do, really, is let this melt. All right. Meat's hot. We're just going to cut it. Potatoes on one side, the garnish on the other. So we get a, take a nice piece of meat out of the center here. Piece of meat here in the middle. A little garnish here on this side. A couple of onions, a spear of asparagus. A little bit of the potatoes, some jus, and the Mimi's demi glace. Look at that, like melted glass, beautiful. So it's beef bourguignon, not, but it's our version of it. I mean, I took the dish apart and put it back together, I know, so it took great liberties, forgive me. All of you French people and Francophiles. But anyway, it's going to be delicious. Try it at home. Have fun. Till next week. Let's dig in.